Hello and welcome tonight. The long wait continues for parents of abducted students in Kankara. It's the second day of the vigil at the school premises. There's growing security concern in Benue State after the killing of a couple by a suspected herdsman. Nigeria's land borders are to be reopened after 16 months of closure. President Buhari orders four of them to be reopened with immediate effect. And the EU hammer falls on Ethiopia as it suspends £90 million aid to the country of a crisis in the Tigray region. Plus we'll have business, sports and later on international news from our studios in London. On business news tonight, Nigeria's central bank orders payment service providers to suspend local currency transfer processing through international money transfer operators. On sports news tonight, Edo State Government accepts new date for the 20th edition of the National Sports Festival. It's day two of the vigil declared by parents of the abducted students of Government Science Secondary School, Kankara, in Katsina State, as they refuse to leave the school premises where they've been waiting anxiously for the turn of their children. The parents say they're not losing hope yet and they are confident that their children will return home. Our report tonight captures the mood of the unrelenting parents of the Kankara school boys. These anxious parents have taken their positions at the Government Science Secondary School, Kankara, for some good news on the welfare of their children. Since the incident happened, I've not been able to sleep. I've been praying, but without any answers. What our children are eating now is leaves and drinking from the lake. I call on our leaders to look into our situation. If it happens to their children, what will they do? According to some of the parents, only three children have so far been accounted for out of 17 announced by the state government. Here, I am here since Saturday. Every day I used to come here in the morning, early morning, till 7 o'clock I used to live here. So I haven't seen anybody uh, that about the 17. But I only see only those three people. And those three people, they escape from the kidnappers they come back so that the matter of 17 is not true they, i have seen it in the media that they, they have rescued 17 but it's not true we know we haven't seen them as i did here since now only one i can say one or two children i've seen so those that they have returned they promised us say 15 are coming but we didn't see them since that day abdul karim ikram's son was Zahiri. just a week old at the Akuchi. school before the incident Zahiri Akuchiu. Indeed, our situation is disturbing. We are worried because our children are still in the bush with these people, but we submit everything to God. The government has promised us that our children will be back latest by tomorrow. We wait and see. As the waiting game continues, expectations are high on the part of parents that efforts to rescue their children will yield positive results. And the Katsina State Governor Aminu Mazare is assuring parents of the missing boys that their children are alive at a hidden enclave where they're being held captive. Governor Mazare explains that security forces have adopted non-kinetic measures to ensure that they reduce collateral damage and then bring the children home. Governor Mazare was our guest today on our program, Politics Today. These are bandits that are roaming the forest of Gampara and parts of Katsina State. So, so far, this is the information we have. And uh, even from the, the leadership of Makaban, this is the information we have. Whatever role any other terrorist group might have played, we are here to confirm it uh, with any empirical evidence. So are you ruling out the involvement of Boko Haram or any other terrorist group in this particular attack? I am not absolutely discounting 
any foreign other ISWAP or Boko Haram indirectly working with the bandits. You know, for well over one year, there were signs that some of the elements of the bandits are making contact with some of the elements of Boko Haram, the ISWAP. So, but with regard to this abduction, we have not seen yet any direct involvement of Boko Haram or ISWAP. However, we are watching developments. We are seeing through the evidences we have. We are going through the tracking system that we have in place to find out if there is any linkage. So far, we are yet to find the linkage. Meanwhile, the national chairman of the main opposition, the People's Democratic Party, Uche Sekondas, has called out the president on the state of insecurity in the country, noting that the nation is in distress and the president has failed to tackle the security challenges. Mr. Sekondas insists that the president has left the country worse than he met it, and if he were in his shoes, he would declare a state of emergency on security in the country and change the entire security architecture. He also asked the president to ensure the quick release of the Kankara schoolboys. Mr. Sekondos was speaking to journalists in Bauchi State during the inauguration of new road projects. We are aware just a week ago that over 40 something to 100 farmers were killed in Borono State. Is Nigeria not in distress? We're in pain. So what else do you want me to describe? The economy is bad. Security is bad. Virtually every facet of Nigerian life had collapsed. What else do you want to hear? You know more than we know. You better let the world know. And those in authority, all we are saying, let President Buhari release the Kassina boys for us. We are in pain. From security in Katsina State to the north-central state of Benue, where a community in the state capital, Makudi, has been thrown into mourning after suspected herdsmen killed a lawyer, his wife and another resident. The attack occurred in the early hours of today, following the raid in the same areas where four persons were killed by armed herdsmen on Saturday. While condemning the killings, Governor Samuel Lotom asked the federal government to step up plans and strategies to stamp out terrorism. These terrorists and jihadists, herdsmen, who most of them are not Nigerians, but have found themselves into Nigeria and have infiltrated almost every part of Nigeria and have continued to kill people. This will not be allowed. Under my watch, working with the security agencies, we we'll continue to ensure that we stop this. You can imagine people who have not offended them. But because the livestock guard are doing very well and the agro rangers are doing very well in Benway State, and that's is responsible for the relative peace that we're enjoying today. Agro Rangers, livestock Guard, the security agencies are not at war with Flanny Hersman, neither are Benway State people against uh, Flanny Hersman. But we're against impunity, and impunity must stop. They are not above the law. They must respect the laws of our land. Once they step into Benue State, they must respect the laws of Benue State. And here, we have prohibition. Intimidating us in this manner will not work. We are not going to accept. These people who have died too, they have been included amongst those martyrs that were killed in 2018. These are the real people who have stood with their blood, defended Benway State, not me, not my government. And we stand with them. 
And I want to send this message to leaders of Fulanese who have brought them to Nigeria and to Benue State to continue to kill, to destroy, and to kill that it is not accepted. Away from security now, human rights lawyer Femi Falano and the former Emir of Kano, Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, are speaking about the issues of restructuring of Nigeria and the country's economic development. And he would not spare President Muhammadu Buhari and his predecessor of blame as far as the actualization of restructuring of the country is concerned. The senior lawyer wants state governors to be alive to their responsibilities by sharing powers with the president on issues of security and the economy. Power devolution to the states from the center without the democratization of such powers will not promote development of the country. In other words, restructuring without the equitable redistribution of the commonwealth will not endanger unity as unity is not an abstract phenomenon. In concrete terms, unity means the corporate existence of Nigeria. The fact that the unity of the country is based on the ruthless exploitation of the working people is of no moment to the members of the ruling class. But for me, since the rich are united in exploiting our national resources, the exploited poor and oppressed people should equally unite to free themselves from the chapel of poverty. For the former Emir of Kano and former CBN governor Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, there is more to the constitutional framing of diversity in Nigeria. If only we lived by the letter and the spirit of the law, would be 70 percent of us we're talking about. You know we have institutions, we have character, we have people, we have people manning institutions. And those people choose not to do the right thing. And then we get the results that we have. Where is our civil service? The security services the judiciary, the police. These institutions are institutions that are called the central bank. These institutions are called unelected power. They are given authority on the condition that their loyalty is to the nation and to the laws of the land, not to individuals. The president today ordered the immediate reopening of four land borders in the country following what he describes as a drastic reduction in the cases of smuggling of weapons and other illegal items into the country. The decision for the reopening of the borders was reached at the end of the virtual Federal Executive Council meeting presided over by the vice president today. President Buhari, who is on a private visit to Daura in Katsina State, also joined the meeting virtually. The land borders had been closed since August 2019 as part of efforts to curtail smuggling and illegal importation of drugs, small arms, food and agriculture products into the country. The Minister of Finance spoke to State House correspondents after the meeting. His Excellency, the President has approved the recommendation of a committee which I chaired with the Minister of um, Industry, Trade and Investment as member, Minister of Interior, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, National Security Advisor, the Controller General of Customs and Immigration. This committee was mandated to review and advise Mr. President on the opening of the Nigerian borders. And after our work, we recommended to the President that Mr. President has approved the reopening of the four land borders, namely uh, some uh, southwest part of the country, Leila in the northwest part of the country, Maitagari in the northwest and north central part of the country, and Mufu in the south south part of the country. So these four land borders will be opened immediately. 
In part two after the break, we have more on the national identification number registration. Plus, the appeal court nullifies seven-year sentence handed down to former PDP Publicity Secretary Olisa Metu, sets aside indictment of former National Security Advisor Colonel Sambo Dasuki. That's in a moment. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channel's television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. The long wait continues for parents of abducted students in Kankara. It's the second day of vigil at the school premises. There's growing security concern in Benue State after the killing of a couple by a suspected herdsman. Nigeria's land borders are to be reopened after 16 months of closure. President Buhari orders four of them reopened with immediate effect. And the EU hammer falls on Ethiopia as it suspends £90 million aid to the country over the crisis in the Tigray region. The House of Representatives is asking the Nigerian Communications Commission to extend the December the 31st deadline issued to SIM card owners to submit their national identification numbers to their network providers. The House lauds the intention of the NCC for security reasons, but wants the process to be extended to 10 weeks, considering the difficulty experienced by Nigerians in obtaining the national identification numbers. Our correspondent Terry Ikumi reports. The two weeks ultimatum issued by the Ministry of Communications for Nigerians to submit their national identification number to their phone service providers or risk being blocked has been generating reactions. I still have one number that is not registered today. So, and I think for security purposes, I think it's a welcome idea. Question is how many offices of NIMSI? Uh, in Abuja, right here uh, in Abuja, you can I can point to three or four, five places where you can do SIM registration. And with COVID-19, if people get into panic and begin to rush into the centers, there could be um, a resurgence and even uh, an increase in in infections. The attention of lawmakers has also been drawn to the matter. In a motion of urgent public importance, the minority leader insists that the intention may be good, but not the timing. Rising from what happened during NSAS, where most Nigerians or most uh, hoodlums were using SIM cards to abuse and terrorize people in office without being able to ascertain or track them. And rising from that, that behavior, the NCC was actually someone, someone by the house. NCC was mandated that they should try as much as possible to ensure that all the service providers get all the SIM cards registered. And to start it is first of all to register with National Identity Card Management. But we did not envisage, Mr. Speaker, that having given that suggestion, that they will not come and say, okay, we are limiting this process to only two weeks. The contributions that follow also suggest the same thing. For security reasons, the intention is good, but more time is needed. The situation whereby kidnappers and other scrupulous elements in the nation will kidnap people and they will be transacting ransom via telecommunication and now and then the security will not be able to track them. So I think it will be good that we give a timeline. I mean, something like after the Christmas, that should end in, uh, on uh, 28 February 2021. Many Nigerians are worried about the numerous data collected for various purposes, such as bank registration, voter registration, SIM card registration, driver's license registration, national identity card, and international passport registration, which do not seem to be harmonized. They also worry that the process needed to acquire the national identification number is not an easy one. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. 
and the NCC's directive to bar the activation of new SIM cards and all phone subscribers without national identification numbers from the network is not sitting well with some Nigerians. Our correspondent Dare Do visits the National Identity Management Commission office in Lagos to see how Nigerians are taking the directive. <laughs> This was the atmosphere at the Lagos office of the National Identity Management Commission months ago when the Joint Admission Matriculation Board made name a compulsory registration requirement. And when the news of the new directive broke that all SIM cards without name will be blocked from mobile networks after a stipulated time, many already dreaded the return of the active days at the National Identity Management Office. Today the mood is different, less chaotic, but anxious applicants sit on their retent waiting to be called in. <laughs> Officials of NIMSI says the process has been simplified and the dates of overwhelming crowd are over. We have about 173 agents that will be involved in data capturing. Not only that, we have small, medium and small, medium scale enterprises that are, can also capture. We have public institutions just like um, we have the state governments to like in Lagos State, we have Ogun State, we have in Delta, we have in Abia, we have Adamawa State governments that have also been licensed to do this data capturing. But there are other arguments. There's a large population, a large percentage of population that have BVN. I'm wondering what would it take to to sync that or for the government to have access. I mean there's biometrics in there, you know, it has all your date of birth, has your mother's maiden name. What does the, the a lot of information that on a good day, if we are looking at privacy, like what, where does the government need me, need that from me? Regardless of what um, the international passport carries or the driver's license carries, you know, let's just trust that this is an opportunity for them to um, restructure everything and make sure that everything they have for every individual is correct. Nigeria has a total active telephone subscription of almost 200 million and the federal government is hoping to audit the database to checkmate the lingering security challenges in the country, among other issues. The NCC says there's a need for a drastic measure to build a credible national database and as well improve the integrity of the SIM card registration process, a move some consider plausible but poorly implemented. Dari Idu, Channel Television News. Meanwhile, the Federal Road Safety Corps is now insisting that the national identification number will be a compulsory requirement for driver's license processing. The FRSC says all applications for the national driver's license in Nigeria must present the national identification number before they can be captured for any class of licenses. FRSC Assistant Corps Marshal B.C. Kazim explains that a harmonized database on citizens' information is critical to resolving the challenges of identifying individuals to assist security agencies in data collation and quick retrievals to address some of the national security challenges. Let's take a look at some legal matters now. The Court of Appeal sitting in Abuja has nullified the conviction and seven-year jail term handed down to the former spokesperson of the People's Democratic Party, Uli Samitu, by Justice Okonabang of the Federal High Court in Abuja. The three-member panel of the court, led by Justice Stephen Adda, in a unanimous judgment, held that the proceedings of the Federal High Court leading to the conviction of Mr. Mitu and his company, were biased and must not be allowed to stand. Justice Ada, who delivered the lead judgment, held that the utterances of the trial judge, Justice Okonabang, in the course of the trial, established that he was biased. The appellate court therefore ordered that the trial be conducted afresh and directed that the case file be sent back to the chief judge of the Federal High Court for reassignment. Justice Okonabang had in his judgment delivered on February the 25th, 2020 and sentenced Mr. Mitu to seven years imprisonment for fraudulently receiving 400 million naira from the Office of the National Security Advisor, then being headed by Colonel Sambo Dasuki. Meanwhile, the court also set aside the indictments delivered against Colonel Dasuki, noting that the Federal High Court made damaging comments against him without giving him a fair hearing.
And when the news at 10 returns, Central Bank of Nigeria orders payment service providers to suspend local currency transfers processing through the international money transfer operators. That's on business news. Please join us again. Welcome back to the News at 10. Against the backdrop of economic revival and job creation, the federal government has given the assurance that the multi-billion naira gas pipeline project that spans from Ajaokuta to Kano will be completed to revitalize some ailing industries in the northern part of the country. The Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, announced this when she led officials from Abuja to the site of the project in Ajaokuta to assess the level of work done on the project. The Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Dr. Zainab Ahmed, accompanied by the Group Managing Director of the NNPC and other top government officials, arrive in Ajalkuta for the inspection of the Ajalkuta Kaduna Kano gas pipeline project. One of the site engineers, Mr. Aldo Ibrahim, conducts the entourage round the project, explaining the level of work done so far. The project, which is being handled by AllServe Limited, is expected to cover 614 kilometers from Ajalkuta in Kogi State to Kano through Abuja and Kaduna State. The contractor explains the progress of work. Normally, in this project, you do engineering design. Then you go on with procurement of the materials, and then you do the construction. So it's a process. But as of now, I can say that if you put it together, we are close to 10% of the entire project. But it will speed up as soon as we have our line pipes. The group managing director of the NNPC briefs the Minister of Finance about the project. The first start is that you're going to cut down gas emission into our environment. So that's going to go down. Number two, we are creating massive wealth along this uh, pipeline because gas will be available to industries, to power, to everything that you can think of. For the Minister of Finance, the project is critical to the nation's economy. We're glad that uh, gas is being piped across this line from Ajakuta to Kaduna to Kano. This will help to revive industries in those parts of the country, create jobs, and even as the construction is going on, you can see a lot of economic activities going on here. Locals are employed and they're working on a day-to-day -day basis with the contractors that are on site. The Ajalkuta Kaduna Kano gas pipeline project was flagged off in July this year. It is 85% funded by the Bank of China and Sinusure which is a Chinese export and credit insurance corporation, while the federal government, represented by the NNPC, provides the remaining 15% equity. Hyphila Natural Limited, manufacturers of organic body care and food products, have attained another milestone in the quest to help Nigerians achieve a healthy lifestyle. This comes as the company launches Avalon water and beverages into the market. The new products were formally unveiled at a ceremony in Lagos. Major distributors and business partners watch with rapt attention as Avila Natural unveils outputs from its expanded business of producing premium table water and other healthy drinks. For the founder and managing director of the company, Avila Water and Drinks represents a commitment to its vision and values. We are here to right the wrong in a society and um, the whole essence of Avila is to inspire people to live healthy and to be happier. These products, they are natural, we don't use fillers, we don't use dye, we allow nature to take its place because integrity is a value that we don't joke with. Besides the premium water, Avila drinks come in seven variants, green tea, tasty tea, black sea tea, ginger and turmeric tea, roselle, orange juice and pineapple juice. Guests at the event had a first-hand opportunity to taste these health beverages. 
with this going into the market is going to solve a whole lot of health issues and it's also going to you know be good for our children i just tasted this now and i'm very optimistic that the whole world is going to embrace this although these drinks are extracted from fruits the management says they are affordable our roselle for instance as healthy as we talk about the roselle roselle is actually going to be coming at a very competitive price more competitive than any other product that you can think of in this country roselle is going to come a 50 cl bottle of roselle 100 percent natural is going to come at 50 naira. let any brand match it in nigeria the teas all the healthy teas that i mentioned to you are also going to be coming at a very competitive price of about 100 naira but to the end user we did not just want to give people products that they will buy and sell. We, from R&D point of view, or from R&D perspectives, we ensure that we add our customers in mind while we're formulating the products. Avila hopes to leverage on the affordability of these products with over 2,000 distributors nationwide to command competitive advantage in the market and reach every household. The third winner in the Trophy Lager Honorable Promo to Bayi has emerged, Abdul Okmade Peter, a resident of Ijebode local government area, is the third winner of one million naira from the third promo draw, and he is ecstatic. In fact, I feel so, so excited. I want to say a big thank you to them, and I pray that the company will continue to flourish. I'm the winner for the one million naira honorable promo. The promo is designed to reward consumers of the premium beer brand across the country with lots of airtime and cash prizes ranging from 5,000 naira to one million naira. According to International Breweries PLC, Brewers of Trophy Lager, more millionaires are expected to emerge in the weekly draws. Consumers are also encouraged to participate in the promo by checking under their favorite trophy lager beer crown cork for a code that will provide an opportunity either to become a millionaire or to win other numerous prizes like airtime and cash prizes. For some more business news now, here's Melinda Akinlami. Thanks, Ijoma. Welcome to Business News. The central bank has directed money market operators to stop processing local currency transfers regarding foreign settlements into domiciliary accounts. In a statement released today, the CBN says the pronouncement, which follows the recent relaxation of rules guiding foreign payments, comes as few operators are complying with the directive given last week. The latest move by the CBN is aimed to shore up the country's foreign exchange reserve, which has been on a steady decline this year amid poor inflow of forex. The governor of Imo State, Hope Uzodima, has proposed 346 billion naira as the 2021 fiscal budget. He told the State House of Assembly that the spending plan, which is tagged budget of wealth creation, has capital expenditure pegged at 271 billion naira, while the current expenditure is pegged at 74 billion naira, which is 21.6 percent of the budget. Lawmakers in the Imo State House of Assembly find their way to their different seats ahead of a special plenary session. The 2021 budget presentation by Governor Okuzodima. Before going into the analysis of the budget, Governor Uzodima briefly speaks on his achievements and the last 11 months as guided by the 2020 revised budget. The 2020 budget was revised in direct response to the physical pressures from both internal and external sources. I'm glad to report that our efforts in this direction enabled us to effectively and courageously contend the public health, health challenges from COVID-19 pandemic, as well as make moderate progress on other economic sectors. According to the governor, the 2021 appropriation bill put so many top priorities into consideration. The above measures will enable the state government to execute its proposed programs 
and projects in the 2021 budget, pay worker salaries, pensions, and gratuities, and run other activities of government. Then the final presentation to the House for approval. While ensuring speedy passage of the budget, lawmakers share their thoughts on the governor's presentation. We have confidence in you. You have shown us confidence in all the projects you have done so far. According to the governor, the instrumentality of the 2021 budget when passed will not only enable the state government to execute its proposed programs and projects, but will also ensure improved security for Imo citizens, ensure job creation, enhance massive economic growth, and increase state internally generated revenue. Egito Kutei, Channel Television News. The equities market has maintained a positive posture for a third consecutive day this week as another round of bargain hunting adds 140 billion naira to the total value of listed equities. Lyo has more. Thank you for joining us for the stock market report. You can say that the good times are gradually coming back again to the stock market and that's because the bull has refused to back down after making its presence more evident in the last two sessions. It appears that the downturn recorded in five sessions at the market last week is turning out to be a blessing in disguise as investors are taking advantage of the drop in the share price of listed high value equities to make some bagging hunting. The renewed interest in some big banks such as Zenith, UBA, Access and GT Bank, as well as some consumer goods blue chip stocks lifted the market's overall performance higher by 0.76%, while 140 billion naira is added to the total value of listed equities. Traders had mentioned earlier in the week that due to clarity at the fixed income markets about the central bank's special bill, which was offered last week at 0.5%, which is not much attractive to investors, and that is why there is sustained interest for equities, as you can see on the activity chart. Now it's two days left within the third trading week of December, but traders say apart from the dynamic nature of the market, they remain hopeful that the bagging hunting will continue for the rest of the week. And that's it on the Stock Markets Report. I'm Layo Adegoke. That's business news. Back to you, Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Melinda. Still ahead on the news at 10, European Union's hammer falls on Ethiopia as it suspends £90 million aid to the country over a crisis in Tigray region. And more from our London studio in Around the World in 5. Do stay with us. Let's bring you a bit more about the Kankara abduction. Leaders of the Coalition of Northern Groups are set to commence an indefinite protest to compel action for the rescue of hundreds of students abducted at the government science secondary school, Kankara. According to the group, the exercise with the hashtag Bring Back Our Boys is expected to proceed to Daura to register the current concerns with the president. The European Union has postponed its disbursement of a £90 million, or rather euro, to the Ethiopian government as part of its support over the crisis in the country's Tigray region. It was emphasised that the decision to halt does not affect the EU's humanitarian programmes on the ground. Here's Simon Pusey with more in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The World Health Organization has urged Europeans to wear face masks during family gatherings at Christmas. It said Europe was at high risk of a new wave of coronavirus infections in the early part of 2021 as transmission of the virus remained high. Countries across the continent have been registering thousands of daily cases and hundreds of deaths. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said the first COVID vaccine would be authorized for use within a week, more than seven days earlier than expected. 
Ursula von der Leyen also says a narrow path has now opened up to strike a post-Brexit trade deal with Britain. The principle of fair competition. The EU Commission president said the next few days are going to be decisive and the negotiations over how a deal would be enforced are largely being resolved. Officials from the EU and UK have been talking in Brussels as they race to strike a deal before the UK stops following EU trading rules on December the 31st. She has also said that talks over fishing rights are still very difficult. The United Nations has warned that millions of children in Ethiopia's Tigray region have remained out of reach from humanitarian assistance. Despite deals with the Ethiopian government, humanitarian agencies have said that they are being denied access to the region, where government forces have been battling the Tigray People's Liberation Front since November the 4th. Reports have suggested that hundreds have been killed in the conflict and about 50,000 have been forced to flee neighbouring Sudan. Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, have signed a deal for a Spotify podcast. Hi guys, I'm Harry. And I'm Meghan. They have received an undisclosed sum to produce and host podcasts with the production company Archwell Audio for Spotify. The first episode, described as a holiday special, is due for release during the Christmas period. The news comes after the couple also signed a deal with Netflix to produce a range of programmes for the streaming service. <laughs> Italy will set up 1,500 circular pop-up vaccine pavilions in squares and town centres around the country. The structures adorned with a flower graphic meant to symbolise regeneration are set to be installed in January and will be used to start the mass immunisation of the population with a COVID-19 vaccine. Architect Stefano Boeri has developed the logo and visual aspects of the country's vaccine rollout. A police drug squad in Peru have raided a house dressed as Santa Claus and an elf, detaining a suspected drug dealer. Officers wearing flak jackets under their costumes arrived in an undercover van before breaking into the house, where they discovered a bag that appeared to contain drugs, balaclavas and a gun. The country's police have used disguises during raids for some time and say the method is an effective tactic. A recording has emerged of actor Tom Cruise shouting at workers on the set of Mission Impossible 7 for breaking COVID-19 protocols. The Sun newspaper has published an explicit recording in which Cruise says, if I see you doing it again, you're gone. The actor can be heard saying, that's it, no apologies, you can tell it to the people that are losing their homes because our industry is shut down. The Sun has reported that Mr Cruise became enraged after spotting two crew members standing together at a computer screen in violation of an on-set rule that requires people to stand six feet apart. And finally, a group of sheep, goats and three lambs have stormed a city hall in Turkey. The group of animals have been chasing workers in the parking lot and city hall entrance. CCTV footage shows municipality workers running away in terror from the animals. They were eventually brought under control and returned to their owner. The mayor of Nevsehir has returned to visit the day after to pet animals that stormed the hall. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thank thanks, Simon. The state government has accepted the new date for the 20th edition of the National Sports Festival built to hold in Benin City. The National Council on Sports on Tuesday presented February the 14th to the 28th next year as the dates for the multiple sports competition after suffering several postponements. 10 Mon Arsenal earned a point against Southampton to bring their three-match losing streak in the English Premier League to an end after playing a one-all draw with Southampton at the Emirates. Elsewhere, Leeds United hammered Newcastle United 5-2 at Ellen Road, while Everton beat Wilfred and did his Leicester City 2-0. Fulham and Brighton settled for a goalless draw, while Crystal Palace also played a one-all draw with West Ham United in a keenly contested encounter. In the eagerly anticipated top-of-the-table clash, Liverpool beat Jose Mourinho's Tottenham 2-1 at Anfield. West Brom have appointed Sam Allardyce as their new head coach. Allardyce signed an 18-month contract which includes a break clause at the end of the season if West Brom are relegated. The former England manager, who has 512 Premier League games to his name, arrives at the Hawthorns with his long-time assistant, Sammy Lee. And that's Rap and Sports News. I'm Ayotun Day. Follow me. Back to you, John.
Thanks a lot, Ayo Tunde. And the main news again. Parents of the abducted students of Government Science Secondary School, Kankara, in Katsina State, today continued their vigil at the school premises, just as leaders of the Coalition of Northern Groups set to commence indefinite protests to compel action for the release of the boys. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thanks so much for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Onyato. Good night.